Today, we're banning a card in Popper, and I want to tell you what it is and why we're doing it. Good morning, Magic. I'm Gavin Verhey from Wizards of the Coast. And in addition to my job designing Magic cards, I also am a member of the Popper Format panel. First, to recap exactly what we do for anybody who is newer to the Popper scene, we monitor the format and manage bannings for Popper. We don't impact Magic sets, select what cards get downshifted, or make new cards for the format with, of course, the exception of me and my normal role as a magic designer. And while certainly we talk and speculate about what kind of cards the format could want, our focus is on the health of the format and the banning or unbanning of cards. That said, let me cut right to the chase. Today we are banning Monastery Swift Spear. Some of you might be wondering why. Others might be wondering why not more. Let me run you through the data and information that led to this decision, how we see decks in the format, and more. We'll start with the state of the format. For a while, Popper has been a decently diverse, non-rotating format. Looking at online events like Magic Online Challenges, many of the top eights feature five to six unique decks. The most recent Popper Geddon, a huge Popper tournament from a few weeks ago with over 500 players, had five different decks in the top eight. If you look at the variety, decks like Affinity, Mono Red, Golgari Gardens, Mono Blue Terror, Familiars, Fairies, Defenders, Cogate, and even more have shown up and been successful. Aggro, control, midrange, even combo showing up. So if the format's been so diverse, what's been the problem? Well, the problem is speed and polarization. Since 2022 began, the format has sped up considerably. The addition of cards like Tolarian Terror, All That Glitters, and Monastery Swift Spear, among others, have led to decks with faster and more explosive starts. And when your starts can be so strong or difficult to interact with, it can make games feel very lopsided. And that's where the polarization comes in. Sure, with average draws, maybe the games are fine. But when Mono Red gets a good draw, or maybe you stumble slightly, you're just dead inside of four turns. When Terror hits the right mix of cantrips or hits off Thought Scour, you're suddenly facing down double Terror on turn three, and so on. So we wanted to make a change, and we talked about a lot of potential bans, and even some unbans. Let me first take you on an extremely candid look through the data from Magic Online Leagues, where the vast majority of Popper is played. We'll start with Mono Red, the most avidly requested deck we banned from, and the one we banned a card from today. Well, for a deck that people love to talk about, it might shock you to learn that its non-mere win rate is 50.8%, barely over half its games. And that's from the best performing lists. Some versions of the deck hit sub 50% win rates. So why ban a card from it then? Well, once again, it's with the polarity. When you look at game one, Mono Red does great. It is favored in the majority of its matchups, but in games two and three, it changes to unfavored in almost all of its matchups. Whether eight elemental blasts or just bringing in a ton of life gain cards, every deck has a ton of options against red. However, that still has a tremendous impact on the format. If people are spending eight sideboard slots on red, that means it becomes harder to fight other decks. It squeezes some archetypes out entirely. Where we want to get to is a place where red is still a viable deck, but it's not so feast or famine. You don't feel forced to dedicate eight slots to it. Its explosive draws are a little less strong and resilient. It is good and healthy if red is a strong deck. It is bad if it's so strong that it warps the format in this way. We evaluated all the cards in the deck and talked about a lot of possible bans, especially with the brand new Goblin Tomb Raider as well. That's another huge get for the deck that can be extremely polar. So let's start with the two different Bottle 2 cards, with Bottling being our internal design name for this effect, named after Elk and Bottle, in Ren's Resolve and Reckless Impulse, which give the deck a ton of card advantage and long game play, while also letting you cheat on lands. Same goes for Experimental Synthesizer. However, these cards really want a density of cheaper plays to get full value out of. The deck has plenty of cheap plays remaining, but losing a marquee one in Monastery Swift Spear is a decent blow to the power of Ren's Resolve and Reckless Impulse. Kaldotha Rebirth gives the deck its strongest starts in conjunction with Goblin Bushwhacker. However, both of these cards have been in Popper for a long time and been both fun enabling a lot of casual, if explosive, strategies. Knocking one of these would be taking out a long time piece of Popper, and it's not clear that this combo is really stronger than just powerful individual cards. Goblin Tomb Raider is the new kid on the block and easy to make a goblin guide when drawn with Great Furnace. It certainly adds to polarity when drawn alongside an artifact land. 
no doubt. And speaking of which, we also talk about artifact lands, but more on that when we get to affinity below. However, everything really kept pointing back to Monastery Swiftspear. It both is what kicked off the huge influx of red in the first place, synergizes with all of the bottle two spells, does a good job of dodging two toughness removal, and generally makes for the most explosive draws the deck has. When your opponent's hand has two or three Swift Spears, you really feel like you get behind fast. We did talk about if we wanted to hit one card or two. We thought we'd start here and then consider after seeing the results if more needed to go. Any of the above cards are certainly on the table. And if you have thoughts after trying the new format, you're welcome to share them with us in the comments down below. Okay, that's a lot about red. Let's move on to some other decks, starting with Affinity. Affinity has been playable in Pomper for a very long time. It's been resilient to bands like Atog and picked up new toys along the way. Most recently, All That Glitters gave the deck a whole new spin with a blue-white version that can slap it on an Ornithopter or Ginger Brute and hit hard out of nowhere. We talked for a long time about bands here, and there were two main directions to go. The first and simple one is just All That Glitters. It's the recent downshift that enables this deck to hit so hard and part of what can make games polar. However, it is pretty easy to disrupt as just an aura that sits on a creature. The second, more nuanced one, is a set of artifact lands, either the 10 bridges or the 5 original Mirrodin artifact lands. Banning the 5 originals also has the knockdown effect of damaging mono red as well, since they lose great furnace. Losing artifact lands is a gigantic blow to both affinity and also the format. They get used in a variety of decks, for example the indestructible ones with cleansing wildfire, and the untapped ones especially have been a part of popper for a very long time, and are beloved. I'll also call out the bridges have been culprits previously, but with this new blue-white build, they only use the four blue-white ones. Though, of course, there is the Jeskai build that won Poppergeddon to consider that does use more of them. This was perhaps one of the most widely and lengthy topics discussed. So with that in mind, let's dig into the data. When it comes to win percentage and matchups, Affinity is a bit of a different story than Mono Red. It does sport a similar win rate, just 50.5%, but it's a lot less polar in its matchups. It has some naturally unfavored matchups, like Black Green Gardens and Fairies builds, whereas Red was advantaged over most other decks. After sideboarding, it only tends to lose ground, picking up more unfavorable matchups. Additionally, there are a lot of sideboard options available when it comes to ways that both fight artifacts or even just kill creatures that are holding on all that glitters. If Red is a little weakened, that hopefully opens up some sideboard slots to help against Affinity. Even just four more removal spells to hit creatures can go a long way toward fighting this build because you can remove the creature holding all that glitters at instant speed. Ultimately, we decided to hold on banning a card from Affinity for now, see what happens with this change to red, and consider it more in a future update depending on what this does. We would love to also hear from you on the artifact lands. How would you feel about the original artifact lands going? How about the bridges? Let us know in the comments down below. Finally, the last of the big three decks people often ask for bans for, I want to talk about Terror. This deck has been blue-black for a long time, and its win rate was never anything wild. However, the addition of Cryptic Serpent with the Commander Master's downshift moved it into a mono blue build, which just seeks to drop these huge creatures into play quickly. We talked about banning a couple options here. The first was just Terror or Serpent themselves, as big threats that came down cheaply and were tough to kill. The second is a spell, the card we most discussed being Lorien Reveal. It lets you cheat on land counts further, gets you a spell into your graveyard as you do, and can pull you out of a tough spot if you flood or get stalled in the late game. So let's look at the data. How is this deck doing? Well, its win percentage actually is under 50%. Affinity, Fairies, Colgate, and Defenders all thrash it solely by the percentages, and of course it is behind against Mono Red too. And while it's certainly capable of winning games, and you can, of course, come up with sideboard plans and so on, it's pretty brutal. Against Cogate, a popular and strong deck, it boasts around only a 30% win rate. Additionally, a new card from the Lost Caverns of Ixalan has really changed the game here as well in Tithing Blade. This card suddenly made Black Green Gardens pick up a huge advantage against Terror, and while it's too early to know if it'll stick, that card threatens to damage this archetype substantially. All of this led to us making no changes to Terror. Now we did talk about some much more aggressive changes to really mix things up. For example, banning two cards from Red, Artifact Lands, and Terror all at once. But there's a few things going on. 
For one, the format still has been pretty diverse. Second, Lost Caverns of Ixalan has introduced some major new pieces, especially Tithing Blade. And while the metagame is moving around, it felt appropriate to make the change we knew we wanted to make and then keep an eye on its evolution. We'd rather make a small change here. And if we have to come back in a couple months and knock another card or two because Swift Spear wasn't enough, that's something we're prepared to do. Now, before I move on to the next topic in the discussion of win rates, if these are the win rates of the decks people talk about the most and they aren't that high, you might be wondering what actually does have the high win rates. It can fluctuate as sets come out, of course, but as of the most recent week we have data for, Familiar sits on top at about 56%. Kage, Black Green Gardens, and Blue Black Fairies, no terrors in sight, are all close behind between 52 and 55%. One other that really surprised me, though the play rate is quite low so the data isn't perfect, is actually White Weenie, with a cool 54% win rate. So maybe give that a spin. Given the relatively low spread of win rates, and that week to week the top decks churn, we have been reticent to make a lot of changes to the format. The problems of speed and polarity have pushed us to act here, and we may do so again. However, we talk about Pomper a lot, and part of the reason we haven't made a change prior is that things have just looked fairly balanced. We did settle on this Monastery Swift Spear ban recently, but wanted to wait to deploy it until after Brazilian Pomper Nationals, which just happened this past weekend, so that the players weren't scrambling to change anything at the last minute. A few final things to talk about. One is unbans. We did talk about unbanning some cards, ranging from as innocent as Prophetic Prism, which we've mentioned previously, to some much wilder options. But when doing a single ban to try and make a small adjustment to the format, we didn't want to accidentally introduce a large new variable at the same time. I think you could still potentially see Prism come off in the future. As I've talked about in some of my previous Popper videos, we did investigate Sinkhole, him to Turak, and High Tide, and decided not to unban them. But bringing cards back is certainly something we have been and will continue to discuss. Next is a question we get on occasion. Why not just aggressively ban and unban cards all the time to shake things up for Popper? After all, it is a very accessible format. While that is somewhat true, for a non-rotating format, I do think a sense of stability is important. People fall in love with decks and play them because they enjoy them. Banning cards from a deck for a few weeks just to shake things up and see what happens isn't the natural kind of churn I think is healthy, and the whiplash could cause people to leave the format entirely. Additionally, if we ban cards every other month perpetually, it doesn't give a great impression to non-popper players about what to expect when they come and try the format, and we want to grow the format over time. I think we could, and should, consider banning a little more aggressively, and we're going to talk about it, but still not at any kind of extreme degree. Finally, I want to talk about the card Blank Goblin, or Name Sticker Goblin, on Magic Online. Though the Magic Online team at Daybreak has done great work to implement this card on Magic Online, there have been some notes from players that the fact this works differently in real life and online to be a strange split for the format. It has mostly shown up some in the format alongside Monastery Swift Spear, which is now banned. We're going to keep an eye on this, and we're not afraid to ban it if at any point it does become a substantial issue and disconnect between formats. Hopefully, this has been a helpful behind-the-scenes look at the format and what led us to this decision. To recapture this one more time at the end, our hope is this will nudge the format toward being a little less fast, a little less polar, and give people more sideboard slots back. It is not meant to kill red. If nothing meaningful in the format changes, we're not afraid to come back within a couple months and make more changes if needed. One of the things we really try to do is be transparent with you all about our changes and why we're making them. We appreciate you watching all of this video, and in return, would love for you to think about all the rationale here, try out the changes to the format, and then reach out to us with your thoughts. And I know we'll be watching the challenges this weekend and in the weeks to come. On behalf of the entire Popper Format panel, thanks for playing Popper, and we hope you enjoy this change to the format. I'll talk with you again soon, and in the meantime, have fun playing Popper. Minus Monastery Swift Spear. You got this. See some things you should be messaging your Australian friends to see if they can win to send to you. Today, we're going to dig into one the Wizards team down in Australia and New Zealand came up with, and I think it's really interesting for everybody to see what's going on down there. And if you live there, this video is going to be of extra special interest to you. So let's dive on in with a splash. And let me tell you about